Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone, or should I say good early evening to everyone. It is Wednesday, June the 23rd, 2021. It is currently 5.04 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas, and we have a lot to talk about. Now, every day, I open up my email inbox and I never have an I I don't ha, I never have an idea. I don't have a clue of what I'm going to find when I open my email inbox. Sometimes it's just filled with insults and criticisms. Sometimes it's it's filled with threats. And a lot of times it's filled with very kind words and words of encouragement. Sometimes it's filled with people asking a question or asking me if I could cover this. Sometimes it's filled with people sending me all of their work that they did on a Bible study exercise. So some days it's encouraging, some days it's discouraging, but I never know what I'm going to find. And today I opened my email inbox and wow. Did I find an email? <laughs> I mean, I if I was to classify this and uh, and a level of significance and just the the in depth subject the, the the depth of the subject contained in the email I I don't even know if if, if this email compares to any other email that I've ever received it's got to be it's got to be up there at the very very top because wow I mean I sit there and I read it about three times and I'm like what. Am I going to do with this? Am I, can I produce episodes? Because it's, go, it's going to require more than one episode. That's why I labeled this part one. It's going to require a lot of work. It's going to require a lot of work for a number of reasons. First, it's just going to take a lot to try to answer the concern and the questions asked in the email. Secondly, it's going to take a number of episodes and take a lot of work because I have to try to produce this in a way that the average person tuning in who may not have a clue what this person is talking about or a clue what I'm going to be talking about, I've got to also structure it in a way that can that they understand as well and it's beneficial to them. And then hopefully I can produce something that this person who sent the email and anyone else who has this concern, they could take all of the episodes I produce and, and, and bring them to someone and go, hey, could you listen to this? I know we're, we keep going back and forth, but could you listen to this? And hopefully it would be beneficial even for them. So in other words, I've got a very very complicated subject to deal with. And I have a number of of factors that I have to keep in mind in trying to deal with this very complicated subject that's very, very deep. And it's going to require an in-depth answer. Now, I know members of Victory Baptist Church, I know you're laughing. I know you're laughing because you think (laughs) that I. it doesn't matter what the question is, you're going to get an in-depth answer. Well, there is truth to that, right? It doesn't matter what you ask me. I'm going to go on a, you know, three-hour discussion about everything. And you're going to be like, I don't care about anything you said. I stopped listening to you as soon as you started talking. But if you ask me a question, you have to be prepared for the long answer the in-depth answer, but let's, uh, in this case, yes, I'm doing a little bit of joking there. I'm a little bit serious as well. Whenever I get a theological question or a biblical question, look, I don't apologize for being in-depth and giving a long answer because when we're dealing with the Bible, when we're dealing with doctrine, when we're dealing with theology, we're dealing with something that deserves the reverence and the respect of an in-depth answer. That's not the time to shorten the answer, and it's not the time to simply give someone something simple so to avoid confusion and and difficulty. No, when we're dealing with doctrine, theology, and scripture, we have to go all in because you know what we want to pursue at all costs? We want to pursue truth. All right, so I have an email here that ultimately, I'm I'm going to simplify this at the beginning. Ultimately, it deals with the doctrine of God. It deals with the doctrine of Christ. 
It, 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 would, it would connect both of those ideas, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ, and, and you understand that. All right. Hey, Twyla, thanks for joining in. I, I hope... Uh, now, Twyla should be... Uh, she, Twyla is currently listening, and I, and I always appreciate when people tell me that they're listening. She's been in this church long enough that she should do a pretty good job. She could probably do a pretty good job teaching this. She probably could because uh, we have definitely covered this kind of topic here in this church a number of times. But we're, we're, I'm going to try my best to work through this. But here's the deal. I got an email, as I was saying. I got an email dealing basically with the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ. All right, simply put. And obviously, whenever we deal with that, with that kind of subject, it deserves the respect and the reverence to really, really make sure we get this right. So here's what I want to do. Before we get to the email, before we get to the subject, I grabbed uh, a notebook and I wrote down a couple of very important important foundational points. Now, anyone who knows me knows I love to kind of build a foundation, especially when we're getting ready to deal with a, a subject that is so in-depth and so complicated. And the reason I do that is because I want to give us that foundation so that we can stand on. As we're sitting here trying to figure some of this out, at times it may get confusing, at times it may be difficult, but you have that firm foundation to stand on. So I'm going to build that foundation, and hopefully this is going to be very beneficial to the person who sent me the email. Now, I know there may be a part of them that says, I know all of this. I I understand you may know it, but I think we all need this reminder, okay? And Sorry, I'm pulling away from the microphone because I'm trying to grab this chair behind me and pull it next to me so I can set, I can put all of my books and notebooks and dictionaries and commentaries and everything else that I have here for this episode, all right? Because we we have a lot to look at, all right? Here we go, all right? Before we even get to the topic, before we even get to the subject, I want us to first establish this as a fact. I want to establish the importance of the doctrine of God the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, etc. Whenever we start dealing with the, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the Trinity, this doctrine, or we can just say when we start dealing with theology proper, and theology is the, the study, the knowledge, the science of God, when we're dealing with God, this is of the utmost importance of, of doctrines. It, it, it is one of the most important uh, doctrines. And let me just explain why, all right? I'll give you two scriptural bases for the importance of it, all right? The first one, you should know the scripture. It's the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. I could quote it, but I'm just going to turn there anywhere and just read it. Gospel of John, chapter 3, you know the verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, this verse establishes some very important concepts. Number one, that if I'm going to have everlasting life, I have to believe in the son of God, the one that was sent by God, his son. Let me read it to you again. For God sent For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If I want everlasting life, I have to believe in the son that God sent. I have to put my faith in him. But this is very, very, very important. My faith must be in the son that was sent. It can't be in a, it can't be, my faith cannot be placed in a, fraudulent version of the son that was sent. It cannot be uh, put in an incorrect uh, understanding of that son. It has, my faith has to be in the son of God that was sent by the father. It has to be that son. My faith in any other idea of that son other than the true one is going to be a worthless faith. Your faith is only Look, if your faith is placed in the wrong thing, then your faith is ultimately going to be useless, right? I can put my faith in the the idea that this piece of paper that I'm holding can stop a bullet. Well, guess what? That's going to be a pretty useless faith because my faith is being placed in a piece of paper that obviously cannot stop a bullet, all right? My faith has to be in the right thing. Well, if... If my salvation is dependent upon my having faith and believing in 
Jesus Christ and the Son of God, I've got to make sure I have the right Son of God. And when I say the right one, in other words, there's been throughout church history, all kinds of people coming along with their their version of the Son of God, their idea of who the Son of God is. And if it's not the correct one, then there is no salvation. I have to also believe in in, in Jesus Christ. I have, to, I have to understand the Son of God and his relationship to the Father. I got to understand that. I got to have the right God. I got to have the right Christ. I've got to have all of that right, or there is no salvation. I cannot stress this enough. This isn't some insignificant doctrine. I don't know if you have seen the comment that was left uh, to, uh, left for me on YouTube where a person called me an idiot and called me all kinds of names and basically told me that critical race theory is far more important and far bigger a threat to the church than the ancient, uh, you know, squabbling, I think he used the word, over the doctrine of the Trinity. So critical race theory, according to this individual, is far more important, and we should be more worried about that than the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, that that's such a modern Christian understanding. The doc- doctrine of the Trinity, it's complicated. Everyone has their different opinions. Uh, it's, not, it's not that important. Wait a minute. The doctrine of the Trinity deals with the essence and nature of God. If I get that wrong, I end up with, come on class, a false God. And guess what a false God cannot do? A false God cannot save. Salvation is based off my belief and faith in the true God. It has to, I have to have the true God, the true Christ. I have to understand that. We, and then, of course, we also know we have to have the right gospel. You have to have the right gospel because a fraudulent gospel is not a gospel at all and it will not save. But I have to have the right God, the right Christ. I have to have this down. So whenever you're dealing with this doctrine, it's not just, oh, that's one of those academic things that people sit around in a seminary classroom arguing about all day. It's, it doesn't, I don't understand it. It's all confusing. You know, that's, I'm not going to worry about it. Oh, you need to worry about it. You need to worry about it because we're dealing with with understanding the true God so that we can experience true salvation because without the true God, there is no salvation. All right, so it's very important for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, in the son that was sent, not in someone's fraudulent version of the son, it's got to be the right one. And another very important verse that I think we all know, is in the book of Exodus. And I don't think we think about this. In the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. Verse 3, thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sun. Thou shall not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Do not create a graven image. Now, why were they not? To, because any image would not truly capture the true essence of God. So therefore, you would ultimately, a graven image creates a fraudulent God, a false God. Well, we may not create a false God in 2021 by going out back and grabbing you know, wood or stone and carving out an idol. But we can create a graven image of God in our mind where we say that we believe in a God, but it's not the God revealed in Scripture. It's a God of our own creation. It's a God of our own imagination. We've imagined this God, formulated this God. I've given you the famous quote a million times. Some of you know what I'm about to say, that God created man in his image And man returned the favor. God created man in his image. And then what we did is started creating a God. And we recreated God into our own image. 
And there's a lot of people throughout church history who had, you know, their own ideas about God, their own ideas about the doctrine of the Trinity, their own ideas about Christ. And this led in church history to all of the problems of the Christological heresies. Now, if you go study the first seven ecumenical councils of of church history, over and over and over, they're dealing with Christological heresies. This people believe this about Christ, and they believe this about Christ, and they believe this about Christ. But it was all graven images. It was a fraudulent Christ. And anyone who put their faith in that Christ would not be saved because it would be a fake Christ. It's easy to say, well, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. Okay, you got to have the right Jesus. So do you have the right Jesus, or do you, have you created a graven image? Graven image, not acceptable. So our salvation is dependent upon it. We are commanded not to have a graven image. Do you have the right God? Now, the God, the right God is the one that is revealed in Scripture, not the one that you take and manipulate Scripture and you go out and you kind of, in a sense, you go create your own image of God. No, all of our images of God have to be removed, destroyed, and we should be left with the only thing that we understand about God, and that is what is revealed in his word. Now, we may understand that he exists from creation, but we can't understand anything else about him. We can understand maybe power. There's certain things, but to truly understand God as he is, we've got to look to the scriptures. That's where we have to start. We get that wrong. Everything else falls apart. So I want you to understand the importance of I want you to understand the importance of the doctrine of God, the importance of the doctrine of Christ, all right? That's the first foundational truth. I want you to understand the importance of the doctrine of God, of Christ, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can just throw in which branch or how you want to state the doctrine. Look, theology proper, if you want to call it theology proper, it is of the utmost importance because we, ha- we have to have the right God, we have to have the right Christ, or we do not have salvation. We have to have that, or, and we are not to create a graven image, All right? Next. The next thing I want you to consider is the inability of the pulpit. The inability of the pulpit. Now, what I'm going to say here is not to make an excuse. I by no means excuse churches for this, but I do want to express the reality and let this email or at least the person who sent me the email and everyone else just understands the difficulty that every pastor faces. When they stand behind that pulpit, you've got all of these important doctrines, all of these areas of theology, you've got church history, you've got so many important things to teach. But sadly, there appears to be an inability to teach those concepts and the way they should be taught from the pulpit because I don't care how many people say they want that. They only want it in a very small dose because if you start getting into any of these serious, some of, like just standing behind the pulpit and teaching the Christological heresies. Okay, he's, here's heresy number one. Here's heresy number two. Here was the person who founded it. This is what it claimed. Here are the problems with it. Just working, and we did this at Victory Baptist Church. We went through all the Christological heresies. Just doing that, right? Anyone, there should be, every pastor has the ability to do that in theory, but there is an inability built into the pulpit because you start doing that, you know what you're going to start hearing? I didn't come to church for a college class. I didn't come to church for a seminary class. I come to church for a sermon, but they want that sermon to be very practical, very, I hate to say it, surface they don't, they don't they they claim they want it really in depth they do but when you start really digging into some of these issues and really going in depth it's amazing how quickly their attitudes change on you i've had people come into this church saying man i'm so tired of the shallow preaching i'm so tired of it i'm like okay well we're going to give that we're going to give you what you want here and then i start preaching start preaching and teaching and teaching and then next thing you know i'm getting a phone call on a monday going you spent an entire sermon dealing with the heading of one of the Psalms. Well, I, I, didn't, I don't want to go to church to hear someone expound the history and of the heading of a Psalm. I, I just want, I, no, I don't want, okay, well, then, you know, so then no, no, I want you to go in depth, but not that in depth. I want you to do it, but I don't want you to do it that way. All of a sudden now, everyone's got a, a rules on how they do it. So what a, pa- a lot of pastors do is just realize, I hate to say it, they're just there to kind of perform for 30 or 45 minutes on a Sunday, 
throw in enough spirituality, be a good communicator, give everybody some warm fuzzies, make everyone happy, get them out on time so that they can get home and don't really step on anyone's toes and don't offend anyone. And a, and a lot of times the, pre, the pulpit becomes in, unable to really articulate these doctrines in any meaningful way. And I've heard sermon after sermon after sermon. Well, they'll, well, they'll kind of like, maybe they're in John chapter one, where you get into in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. You'll, you'll get into some of these verses that really brings up all of these concepts of the nature of God, the nature of Christ, all of these issues. And time and time again, the pastor will just try to just, it's, it's almost just like qu- quickly paint over it. And in many cases, and b- because they're being so brief, they end up saying something that's not even completely accurate. They, they will say something completely wrong. I cannot even tell you how many sermons I've heard where pastors try to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. And they're not even, and again, it's not, they're not going to go in depth. They're not going to spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. It's going to be barely mentioned. And when they're done, you just like, oh, what did they just do? They just taught modalism, Sabellianism. They, they just denied the doctrine of the Trinity 500 different ways. And then you email them and they basically tell you, I don't care. You basically look at my church, look at your church. You got nobody. I got, I got 3,000. You're the loser, not me. Okay, well, congratulate. You're right. I'm the loser. You're not the loser. Thank you. I'm glad you've got 3,000 people, but you just all literally just taught them a false God. You literally just gave them a false God and you created a graven image and you gave everyone a wrong understanding because that's an ancient heresy, but they don't care. Now, again, sometimes... I I understand the difficulty because you don't want people to leave. I mean, you want people to stay. So if if that pastor's livelihood is connected to it, they they just kind of find there's all they 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 find a comfortable rut that they can just keep the car in. Like, okay, here here I'm driving the car of this church. Oh no, the road there's all these ruts. Okay, here's a nice comfortable rut. Let's just stay in this rut. Let's not try to pull out of, because if we if we pull out of it, it's going to rock the boat, create problems. Next thing you know, people's leaving the church. I just got to keep everyone happy, happy and comfortable or people are going to leave. And I hate that, but it's just true. And, and everyone said, oh, I want in-depth teaching. Well, not that in-depth. I want in-depth teaching. I want to be challenged. Well, I don't want to be challenged like that. Now you made it difficult. Now you made it uncomfortable. Now I don't know what to do. So, so just, so what do you want? Like sometimes as a pastor, you just want to scream, what do you people want? And they, it, sometimes they can't even articulate what they want, but they don't really want any in-depth teaching. Well, guess what? Well, you got millions of Christians around the world who never really dig in to these in-depth issues about Christ, the Trinity, the deity of Christ. They don't really dig into any of these things in any meaningful way. Well, guess what? You're, you're, these people are not only are they vulnerable, they, they, they don't even know what to believe. Or that, Like you can say, hey, look, you're believing something false and they don't get it. And it's the inability of the pulpit. And again, the pulpit has the ability but I mean, even sometimes as preachers, I, I've, I've asked this question a million times. Why do preachers go to seminary? I really don't understand why. Go to seminary all of these years. We get all of these degrees in you know, a religious education, church history, theology. I mean, I've got, I've got associates, bachelors, masters. But you know what you're told when you get behind the pulpit? You really can't teach that. You really, that's too deep for the, I always hear that. That's too deep for the people. And it drives me, why? Then why did we learn it? If I go to if I go to seminary to learn this, and then I never teach it, what was the per- point of learning it? My my theory is everything I learned in every school I went to, my people are getting it in some way, shape, or form. Because if it was important for me to know, why wouldn't it be important for them to know, right? Or, or because am I just you know? Well, I'm the pastor and I have this theological knowledge, so everyone's just supposed to listen to me. We know that doesn't work in the Protestant world, so then teach it. And sometimes when you teach it, you got to really teach it. You've got to really, and which requires maybe hours and weeks and months digging through things in a very, at times, tedious way. And a lot of people won't put up with it. But I, I hate the fact that the pulpit sometimes is so, so lacking in covering some of these issues and then 
Well, then people find themselves in all kinds of theological confusion, and it comes from it, the, pulp, the pulpit is to blame. All right. Now, I know we're doing a lot of foundational work here, but that's okay. All right. So we have the importance of the doctrine. Why is the doctrine important? John 3, 16. Salvation is dependent on faith in the right Jesus. You have the wrong Jesus, the wrong God. There isn't salvation. All right. You are told not to create a graven image. You create a graven image whenever in your mind you have an idea and understanding of God that does not reflect the true God as revealed in Scripture. Just understand the inability of the pulpit. All right, churches, churches find themselves in all kinds of difficulties and, and, and what to do and how to teach, and it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Now, you should try to find a church that will teach that. Sadly, in many cases, you won't, and then you have to rely on, I don't know, up like this, a podcast coming from in a little church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and you got to sometimes rely on that. And it's just frustrating when in many cases you have to rely on ministries outside of your church to do what your church should be doing. <laughs> that that frustrates me to no end, all right? But well, that's a whole different uh, podcast, all right? Then third, I want especially the, the person who sent me the email to hear what I'm about to say here. We need to remember the importance of the doctrine. We need to understand the inability of the pulpit. And number three, we must never forget that we have to always include the fruit of the Spirit to our theology. Now, I have struggled with this in my own Christian life, and so I say this as a just a, an exhortation right? An exhortation. And I say this is to exhort you and maybe to, to just constantly remind myself and rebuke myself of how dangerous it is. Forget this. It's very easy after all that we, you can you can become worried about orthodoxy and theology, which we should always be worried about, but you can become so preoccupied on the orthodoxy of theology that you're getting all your theology right. But then some of those basic fruits of the spirit, we don't focus on, we're not we're not working on developing and letting that grow. And we may, we can turn around with being very theologically correct, but messed up in a lot of our basic Christian practice and living. And we've got to balance the two out. All right. Um, Go to Galatians chapter five. I know, you know, the probably everyone listening knows where I'm going, but go to Galatians chapter five. Let me just remind you with your theology, Correct Christ, Christology, correct doctrine of the Trinity, correct understanding of God, all of those things, all of that understanding, it must be met, mixed with this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. A love for God, a love for others, even a love for your theological enemies. Joy, peace, long suffering. Got to be patient with other people. Gentle, goodness and faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. We've got to balance it out. Sometimes we get our theology right, and sometimes I've met people who are so theologically sound, but they are some of the worst people you ever want to know. They are mean, condescending, hateful, unloving, will stab you in the back in 3.2 seconds, gossip, slander, bitter, and it's just like, okay, your theology is wonderful, but I would rather live on another planet, okay? That doesn't even have air because I just want to get away from you. That's not good, all right? We have to have the balance there. So sometimes when a person is moving away from one theological system, because they realize that theological system is basically heretical, and as they're moving away, theology becomes the most important. And sometimes all of these other practical areas of your Christian life, you can forget. And you've got to maintain that right spiritual attitude and mindset that that balances your right theology, right? You want your right theology, in a sense, you want your right theology to be carried about because you're going to be the one carrying it about, but carrying it about in a person that also reflects the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, and temperance, and all of these other attitudes and that we need to demonstrate. And sometimes it's just we get, the, we get so focused on the theology that the other suffers, and so you don't want that. You've got to balance that out, all right? Three, 
or how many did I just give you? <laughs> I gave you, you see, um, now I give you three. So let's go through them again. Number one, the importance of the doctrine of God. Why is it important? John three sixteen, Exodus chapter 20. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You got to believe in the true and the true God and, 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 and the true Jesus. If you, if you get that wrong, you're just all kinds of problems, all right? And look, I understand one God, three distinct persons. So there I'm speaking of the distinction of the person, the father and the son, all right? You get the idea, all right? Uh, number two, uh, the uh, the inability of the pulpit. I mean, just sadly, the pulpit seems to be lacking the ability to really deal with these issues, and that's why there's so many so much confusion and so many Christians you run into. It's just so much confusion, and at times you just like, what is going on? All right. Number three, always always involve, always include. I should say, I can't read my own writing. Always include the fruit of the spirit to your theology. Galatians five twenty two. Now, I say all of that because that lays the foundation for what we need to do. Are you ready? Here is the email I received. Let me give you the time. I received this at 11.41 a.m. At 11.41 a.m. It says, hello again. I just finished up your series on Bethel And it is going to take great restraint to stick to one topic because your passion for this was incredibly refreshing. All right. Some people, thank you very much for saying that. Some people find my passion refreshing. Some people find my passion greatly irritating. I think it's all a matter of perspective. I think when people agree with me, they love my passion. And when they disagree with me, they get irritated. So, but yes, I... to be fair, though, doesn't matter what I'm talking about. I can be talking about the weather, and, and, and I'm going to be animated, and and just that's just the way I deal with everything. Okay, but all right, that that's a whole different subject. But um, but thank you. Now, for those who don't know, I've done, I've been do- working on. I was working temporarily on a series where we were reviewing. Bethel Church, now Bethel Church is located in Redding, California. Bethel Church is one of the most influential churches in America, maybe one of the most influential churches in the world. And there are also a church surrounded by controversy. For example, I'll just go to this because it's an easy example that made mainstream news. What a two-year-old girl died. Her name was Olive. And instead of moving forward towards the funeral, they waited because they were going to have these services where they were going to wake up Olive. They were going, she was going to be resurrected. Of course, it did not happen, and you can talk about it. So there's there's been all kinds of controversy surrounding Bethel Church, their beliefs, and their practice. But Bethel Church, at some point, decided recently that they were going to help you rediscover Bethel Church by clarifying their doctrine and theology. So we started reviewing this series of videos that they were putting out where they were helping clarify their doctrine and theology. Now, to be fair... <laughs> I didn't make it very far because I got very irritated and very frustrated because to me, they weren't clarifying anything. I've made the joke their clarification needs a clarification. In fact, their clarification needs a warning label that, you know, you know, before you click play, be prepared that heresy may be on the way. It's it's very problematic. And I just got irritated and frustrated because some of it was the standard charismatic stuff that, you know, I cannot stand. And so I kind of stopped temporarily. Well, this person emailed me the other day and was like, hey, I'm really loving this. You know, don't stop. You know, I'm coming out of a charismatic church. This is very important. And so I was like, okay, I'll do whatever you need, whatever you want me to do. I will, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'll turn the microphone on and I, I'm at your service. I'll, I'll spend hour after hour after hour after hour trying to help you. I'm, I'm willing to even go back to the Bethel videos and go through all of them if that's what people want. But I said, you email me what you need and then I will do my best to address it. And that's what brings us here right now. Now, those foundational points I gave you are really for this person specifically, but it's for all of us. We need those foundational principles, all right? Here we go. So, I just finished up your series on Bethel, and it's going to take great restraint to stick to one topic because your passion for this was incredibly refreshing. I have a tendency to get very worked up about this stuff. Well, amen. Don't 
Don't feel bad about getting worked up with this stuff because we should all get worked up about doctrine and theology and the word of God. We should get worked up. We should get passionate about it. We should. Now, we we don't want to violate the fruits of the spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit by by demonstrating, you know, a carnal attitude. But I but I I struggle with that when we deal with charismatic theology and we start getting into their doctrine of that healing is guaranteed, you my anger comes pouring out of me because that that is such a damning, damaging theology that it, it, I all I can see is the people who've been hurt and destroyed by it, and I get angry. So I have to try to maintain the fruits of the Spirit there. Now, there is a righteous anger. There is a godly anger, but it's always easy to tell us that our anger is righteous when in reality it's not. There's nothing with getting worked up and passion, passion, pa- passionate about it. We just have to handle ourselves in a godly way, right? And it's, and it's always a, a struggle, all right? It says, I'm having great trouble with gentleness and clarity regarding these issues. Now, you see why I gave some of those foundational points? Because I want to help this person maybe develop some gentleness and try to get them a a, a foundation to stand on as we try to develop some clarity here, all right? That being said, I'm going to bring up the first topic of grave concern. You got into this a little in your part two response. The number one issue I see with the organization we are part of has to do with Christology. Now, stop right there. Now, the organization they're a part of, even if I had the name, I would not give the name. Um, And I I think I do have the name. I think they gave me a link to one of the sermons. And at some point, we'll probably review it uh, because it'll just be, I I love reviewing sermons. So at some point, we will. But um, their issue that they're struggling with is this, this subject and the organization that they were a part of Christology. All right. Now, Christology is the is the study and the understanding of Christ. Now, let me make it very clear why our Christology has to be right. Why? Because we have to have the right Christ. If our Christology is wrong and we don't have the right Christ, then guess what? We don't have salvation. The, a wrong Jesus doesn't save. A fake, fraudulent Jesus doesn't save. A, a Jesus that is a the product of our own imagination where we created a graven image does not save. So if you're a part of a church and you're like, their Christology is in, is majorly problematic, well, yeah, that's dangerous. And the issue is, is this Christology that they are experiencing, is this problem, their Christ, Christological problems, are they also present within Bethel Church? We're going to consider that along with understanding this this Christological issue, all right? Now, this person says, I would would like to know what you think. Am I on the right right track to tell people this is a major issue? Let me stop right there. I think I've already answered that for you. The doctrine of God and Christ, the Trinity, all of that is a major. what What can be more major than the doctrine of God? What can be more major than God? Wrong God, no salvation. Wrong God, you have an idol. Wrong God, you're an idolater. Wrong God, you are condemned. It's that, it's that simple. It is the issue. Now, I know every Christians all around you are going to say, well, you, you're getting all too nuanced and you're getting too deep into this. And, and it's just a matter of semantics. And we say it this way and you say it that way. It's no big deal. We just saw this with the Southern Baptist Convention. We had the president of the Southern Baptist Convention that on his church website tells us that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three parts of one God. That's complete blatant heresy. Once confronted, he doesn't even address the issue. He just, he just ignores the, 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 the people bringing it up. And then, I don't know, within a minute, two minutes, three minutes, they just remove that phrase from the church website, and nobody cares. I guess no one in the Southern Baptist Convention even cares that possibly their new president denies the doctrine of the Trinity. Everyone around you is going to tell you it's not a major issue. Everyone around you is going to make you feel like that you're crazy and that you're being nitpicky and that you just think you're smarter than everyone else. And it's not that. It's the doctrine of God. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, it's got to be belief in the correct Jesus. It's got to be belief in the true God. And, and again, any, any belief you have 
that's incorrect about God, you've created a graven image. You're an idolater. So it is a major issue. So don't feel bad for thinking. For, now, everyone around you is going to tell you it's not, but it is a major issue. It says, I will be asking more questions, but to me, this is, a top, this is of top importance. Please understand, I am learning and still have confusion. So there may be things I state wrongly or misunderstand. Please correct any theological errors I am presenting. Now, first and foremost, do not ever, do not ever lose that attitude. The minute you are not willing to be corrected about any theological errors and have the humility to ask people to correct you, what I have found too many times is no one wants, they won't even listen to you. They just want to immediately tell you you're wrong and they want to immediately argue. Maintain that humility. The more, now listen, the more you learn, maintaining that humility will become very, very difficult. Here's what happens. The more we learn, we become full of ourselves. And humility is the emptying of ourselves. So no matter how much you learn, you got to empty all of that out. Because no, listen, no matter how much you know today, I'm telling you, there's still more to learn tomorrow. And so you've got to empty it, constantly be emptying yourself out and remaining humble. Whatever you think you know today could possibly need to be corrected tomorrow, right? You've got to maintain that humility. Please maintain that humility. The more theologically sound you become, it's very easy to become very arrogant and like, we've got it all figured out and look at all of these dumb people. They don't. I've been there in my own Christian life struggling with that mentality. We've got to remain humble. So I'll try to keep you humble. You try to keep me humble. Look, uh, I, when they, they say things like, I may state them wrongly or misunderstand, I may state them wrongly. I may misunderstand. We're, we're on this uh, journey together trying to figure this out, all right? But I will correct, obviously, any theological errors that you are presenting uh, because, well, that's, that's the way we grow, right? That's, that's, we're going we're gonna to exhort and encourage one another. It says, allow me to elaborate. Here we go. And what bothers me is I think all the listeners of, this, of, the, of the Theology Central podcast are always more articulate than I am. Okay, <laughs> everyone else can speak and write better than I can, but I'm the one who sits here for 17 hours a day sitting in an empty building talking into a microphone. Okay, maybe I, I, everyone else is more articulate. I'm just insane enough to, to choose to do this, all right? But here we go. And part two. Now, the part two is in reference to my response to Bethel, all right? Or my, my review of Bethel's response. I think that, so I was responding to Bethel's response, if, that makes any sense at all, all right? And part two, at about the 36-minute mark, Bill Johnson began talking about Jesus being our perfect example. At 37 minutes, you ask some important questions. In short, are you saying we can do what Jesus did? And I believe that is, that, that's what is being taught. I'm not sure about the sinless perfection. Now, this seems to be, in our review of what Bethel said, they seem to pretty much just come out and say that, hey, what Jesus did, you can do. We can do what Jesus did. Now, that's problematic in a million different ways. Jesus did a lot of things that I haven't pulled off, okay? I, I can go on and on and on all the things. Jesus, he seemed to know what people were thinking. He seemed to know what was in their heart. He seemed to, well, he could walk on water. He could calm a storm. He could resurrect someone from the dead. He can forgive sins. There's a lot of things he, I cannot do. And why? Let me make it very clear. He is God incarnate the eternal son of God, deity, true God in human flesh, all right? That him being God means clearly he's different than me. But there is this thing within some charismatic circles that know what, that Jesus basically lived his life like we are, but he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we get that same power of the Holy Spirit, we can do exactly what Jesus did. Now, of course, charismatics have been claiming that forever and they're yet to pull it off because every time they claim that they're doing what Jesus did, you do a little bit of investigation and you find out that it's all fraudulent lies and it's smoke and mirrors and it's a, it's a fraud. So yeah, I think I, I came to, from, away from it that they were saying the exact, that exact same thing, which is problematic. But here's the question. 
What is the theological issue at the behind this way of thinking? And I want you to hear what I'm saying. So someone comes along and says, hey, everyone, look, you see Jesus? He's our example. We can be like Jesus. All right, now this is what we need. We need the power of the Holy Spirit and we can do what Jesus did. All right, now go do it. Okay, that's the practical manifestation of a theological belief that 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 practical manifestation flows from. We've got to get to the theology behind it. Many Christians would not be able to identify the theology behind it, but this emailer obviously has a lot of theological knowledge and understands, no, this is a serious theological issue behind it. And that's how it always works. A lot of people think, well, theology isn't that important theology. No, everything practical flows from our theology. I remember when I was, you know, getting ready to, I was trying to find a church to join when I first moved here to Abilene, and the pastor came over and I asked theological question after theological question after theological question about the nature of God, the doctrine of the Trinity, immutability of God, I mean, um, omniscience, omnipresence, all the attributes of God, and at some point he's like, you know, I, 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 I can't wait till you actually start asking me something practical. And I was like, well, you know, uh, here's a practical suggestion. There's the front door, leave. Because if you don't think theology is practical, then then your church is just, that's just a red flag all over the place. Everything the church practically does has to flow from a correct theology. If the theology is incorrect, then everything you do practically and practice is going to be incorrect because its foundation is a flawed theology. So this idea that, hey, you can do what Jesus did What's the theology behind it, right? This is an important question, right? Here we go. All right, we're at 46 minutes. Ah, I'm going to need to be here like about till midnight tonight. All right, here we go. Uh, So so in part two, about the 36-minute mark, Bill Johnson began talking about Jesus being our perfect example. At 37 minutes, you ask some important questions. In short, are you saying that we can do what Jesus did? This is what I said in my response. I was like, are, are, okay, are you guys saying that we can do what Jesus did? Right? Which is really, <laughs> I was like, whoa, what is going on? And this person says, and I believe that that is what is being taught. And so am I. I'm not sure about the sinless perfection thing. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about that either. I don't know if they were claiming sinless perfection, but I would think you would have to include it. And here's the reason why. If Jesus... Are you saying Jesus never sinned and the reason he never sinned because he was living in the power of the Holy Spirit, then in theory, I could never sin if I'm living in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you'd have to, I guess, according to this way of thinking, you would have to make it a, that it's possible that no, that we could all be sinlessly, all without sin and reach a level of sinless perfection if we'll just rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And sadly though, that way of thinking is in a lot of churches. Um, even though they claim we may, we, you know, we may not do it, but we can, which, okay, well, if we can, then why doesn't someone do it? All right, but let's continue. All right, I'm getting like 900 notifications coming into my iPad right now. I have no idea. I guess I'm making all kinds of people mad. All right, here we go. All right, if you hear gunshots, people have found me. All right, here we go. Um, but I think they are saying we should be able to do any miracles, raise the dead, etc. At 48 minutes, you plead for understanding. This is what I understand. And yes, I was like, hey, if anyone's familiar with this kind of charismatic idea, let me know. Let me know. Now, I did that for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to spark the conversation. So it looks like I've accomplished that. And two, because I I thought I understood it, but I wasn't perfectly clear. And I, I know that we have some listeners who are far more familiar with Bethel than I am. And so anytime... I hear, you know, someone from a church say something and I don't quite, I, like, I think I know what the theological issue is. I, I'm always looking to go, okay, is, is that really what, what's going on there? So I, I was doing it more out of a, a need for caution, but I understood what I thought was going on, but I wanted to be careful. But this person's going to bring it up. So we're going to jump right in. All right, here we go. We're at 48 minutes. We're not going to get far. Um, I'm probably going to turn right back around and do another live broadcast on this. All right, here we go. I know there's so many other things we need. There's a lot of things we need to do, but um, this this right now is of the most important. This is the most important thing that we're doing. All right, here we go. This teaching is based on the passage in Philippians 2, 7. All right, so we know what we're going to do, class. Philippians 2, 7. 
That's where we need to go. Philippians 2, 7. Philippians 2, 7. Very, very, very important passage of Scripture. Very important passage of Scripture here, okay? Paul writing to the church of Philippi, right? There's a lot going on here. We may have to come back and do some serious teaching on this section. Um, I've taught on it multiple times. I think I've done some Bible study exercises on part of this as well, and I may have to do some more Bible study exercises because, look, if a doctrine, this is very important, if a doctrine is based off a scripture, then our job first and foremost is to figure out everything that everything we can about that scripture because sometimes just understanding the scripture correctly in many cases can correct all of the theological confusion that's out there. So we'll see. We're not going to quite take that approach now, but we may work our way back to this. Right, here we go. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, here's the key. I'm reading from the King James. But made himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, the King James, when you just look at made himself of no reputation, you, you don't maybe, uh, you may not immediately see a problem. You're like, okay, he's God, but he t- takes on the form of a servant. He makes himself of no reputation. He, he, in, in a sense, he, he takes on the form and, and, and the appearance of something that nobody quite under, they don't, they can't quite see and understand that he's truly God. They're, they're going to see a man. They're going to see a servant. They're going to see this. And so you may not quite see a problem, but there, are, th- within theology, there has been much dispute in regards to exactly what's going on in Philippians 2, 7. Now, listen, there is orthodox, correct discussion and struggle And then in church history, there has been struggle and debate about it that slid over into an unorthodox, heretical view. Let me try to establish what's going on here. If Philippians 2, 7 is saying something like, well, Jesus basically laid aside his deity and just basically lived like a man, and look at what he did as a man, well, then you can do it as a man as well. If he is saying, say, well, I am deity, but I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to live as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you can go, well, guess what? I can do the same thing because I have the same Holy Spirit so I can live like Jesus. So the church should be filled with a little, a lot of little Jesus running around doing everything Jesus did. Raising the dead, healing the sick, walking on water, stopping hurricanes that are, stopping a tornado, doing everything Jesus did. Right, and I guess that would mean forgive sins, right? I, well, maybe not. Maybe not forgive. Well, if he's forgiving sins, is he doing that as a man or is he doing that as God? It can't because can't only God forgive sins? Okay, we we won't even go into that. All right, but I mean we will at some point. So that's so this issue Philippians two seven becomes the key verse. Now the issue in Philippians two seven is a Greek word, right? See why we were, see one of the reasons in our series we were doing a Greek word of the day. One of the reasons we're doing this is because of this type of thing. Knowing sometimes these Greek terms is very important. But if you have the Blue Letter Bible app, go to Philippians 2.7. Philippians 2.7, open up the interlinear, and I will show you the Greek word, all right? Um, if I'm looking at English, but himself made of no reputation, that's the way the King James has it. That phrase, made of no reputation, comes from a Greek word. That Greek word is this. Strong's G2758. Kanao. 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 Now, yes, you can walk around saying kanao and looking really, really smart. Okay, I'm joking. It's a serious word. Kanao is the word where all of this theological confusion arises. So the issue is, what does your church believe about the kana'o? What does Bethel Church believe about the kana'o? What does your charismatic church believe about the kana'o? Now, there is either correct, there's going to be a correct understanding and an incorrect understanding. Now, if we, uh, it's used five times in the King James, 
Kana'o is used five times in the King James. It's translated in the following manner. Make void two times. Make of none effect one time. Make of no reputation one time. Be in vain. Now, look at the Strong's definition. This is where people get very, this is where things can get very tricky. To make empty, to abase, neutralize, falsify, make of no effect, of no reputation, void, be in vain. Now, if we look at the outline of biblical usage, here's what happens. Means to empty, make empty. Of Christ, he laid aside equality with or the form of God. Now, listen to that carefully. So, when in Philippians 2, 7, when the kanao, when Christ, in a sense, made himself of no reputation or made of no reputation, what was he doing there? What was he laying aside? Was he laying aside uh, the idea of being equal with God, his equality with God? Well, was he laying aside being equal with God or like what, 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 what's going, what do we understand by that? And we got to be very careful how we say it because if we say something incorrect, we end up creating a wrong understanding of Christ during the incarnation, which can be massively problematic. We end up with a false Jesus. So it sounds very technical and it is very technical, but it's of the utmost importance. So he laid aside equality with or the form of God Okay, well, he took on human flesh, so, all right, okay. To make void, deprive of force, render vain, useless, of no effect, to make void, to cause a thing to be seen, to be seen to be empty, hollow, or false. All right, so the kanao, that's where everything comes into play. Now, let me go back to the email. The kanao. Now, this teaching, all right, is based, now the teaching that they are referring to is the teaching that you and I can do what Jesus did. It is based on the passage in Philippians 2, 7. Why? Jesus, the kanao, Jesus lays something aside and they're claiming he laid enough aside, basically laid aside his deity, that guess what? That then he became just, basically lived his life just like a man. We can live just like him because we have the same Holy Spirit, All right? Now, this is important. This idea, this teaching is called kenotic theology or kenosis theory. Kenotic theology or kenosis theory, right? Kenotic theology or kenosis theory, sometimes it's written out as kenoticism. Kenoticism, that's spelled K-E-N-O-T-I-C-I-S-M, kenoticism. Kenoticism, all right, or kenotic theology. We have to understand what this kenotic theology or kenosis theory teaches, what it is. And let me just say, kenotic theory, or, or let me say it correctly, kenotic theology or kenosis theory or kenoticism it has been deemed a heresy. It is viewed as a heresy. It has been declared to be heretical. We need to figure out why, what exactly is going on, what is a correct understanding, and how does this relate to Bethel Church? Now, I have a video from Bethel Church called Kenosis and Jesus' Deity. All right, so we're going to hear from Bethel. Now, we're at 58 minutes, so we're not going to hear it in this episode, but that's okay. In the meantime, let's get us a little bit of understanding of what kenoticism is or kenosis theory, all right? Um, let's go, I'm going to go with a, a pretty simple, and I, I've got a number of books here and dictionaries, so I'm going to be pulling from a number of resources here, all right? The term kenosis comes from the Greek word kenao, Translated emptied in chapter two of Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's not always translated emptied, but it does. So let me read from the New American Standard where it's translated this way. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, 
taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Please note, he emptied himself. Ent- emptied himself of what? Now, please understand the, the, the logic here. If he emptied himself of deity, then Jesus lived as a man. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at what he did. Now, I, I'm a man, right? And now if I can, I have the same Holy Spirit, I can do what Jesus did because Jesus did not live He set aside, he emptied himself of his deity. That's the claim of this kenosis theory and idea. In fact, they're going to explain it here in a minute. What has come to be called kenotic theology attempts to understand the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity in light of the kenosis of Philippians 2.7. Its aim is to solve some of the supposed paradoxes arising from Jesus having both a divine nature and a human nature a divine nature and a human nature. For example, how could an all-knowing God become a baby? How could he, how could God be tempted? Or how could Jesus being God not know the time of his return? Now, these are, these are very important theological questions. And no matter how complicated they are, and no matter how much they don't make for good preaching on a Sunday, they have to be taught and preached from the pulpit. The danger comes when it is concluded that in the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity took on a human nature and gave up or lost some of the divine attributes such that Jesus was not fully divine. The doctrine of the two natures of Christ, known as the hypostatic union, maintains that Jesus possessed a full, undiminished human nature and a full, undiminished divine nature, which were not combined or confused into some new nature, but were but were added to each other forever, yet remaining distinct in the one person of Jesus Christ. So let me stop here. The hypostatic union. This is what you need to do. You need to look up the Chalcedonian Creed, or sometimes known as the Chalcedonian definition, or sometimes known as the definition of Chalcedon, right? The definition of Chalcedon. Everyone needs to read the definition of Chalcedon. Now, the definition of the Council of Chalcedon, this happened in 451 AD. This council was dealing with a a, a very specific problem, all right? Eutychianism, if you, if you want to know, was a, a, a problem at the time. It's, it's different than what we're dealing with, but you still need to know the definition of the Council of Chalcedon. You need to know the creed of the Council of Chalcedon. Look it up, all right? Now, the problem is 90% of the Christians you know probably don't even know that the council, the creed of, uh, the, don't know the de- definition of the Council of Chalcedon, probably don't even know the Council of Chalcedon met in 451, probably doesn't know the creed, probably never heard it taught, probably never heard it preached, And guess what? If they don't, then their understanding of, and just think about this, just think about all the Christians you know, their understanding of Jesus, his relationship to the Father, the doctrine of the Trinity, is in most cases based off the shallow preaching that they receive from most pulpits. Well, you can't expect them to get it. You can't expect them to understand it. Now, if there's no excuse if there's no excuse because they have access to all of this information in church history, it's there, but they usually need someone to guide them to that. And, and now, and yes, some Christians don't care. That's problematic. But the, sadly, the, 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 the Chalcedonian definition, the hypostatic union, should be taught in every church. We've taught it here numerous times, over and over and over again, and you have to have this down. So, that's what, for this part, that's what I'm going to leave with for you as your homework. Look up the Council of Chalcedon. Look up the Creed of Chalcedon. I'm going to make it easy for everyone. What I will do is I'm going to take the, uh, the Chalcedonian Creed and I'm going to place it um, on the theologycentral.net. Um, I'm going to do a blog entry where I place the Creed right there. So theologycentral.net, go to the blog section. It will be there. You got to give me a few minutes. Uh, but I will get that put there and it will be right there for you. I will also look if there's any good study guides on the Chalcedonian Creed or the definition of Chalcedon. And if I find some good study guides, then I will put them in the Theology Central Book Club, 
which you can join the Theology Central Book Club by going to theologycentral.net, looking for the entry for the book club. Um, I will try to place those resources there, and then I may take one of those resources and then use it to develop some teaching on the Chalcedonian Creed, right? And then we can really add some more foundation here, right? So in review, in review, this is what I want you to understand. I'm dropping all of my books. First, I want you to understand, very important, the foundation that we've kind of laid for all of this, all right? I want you to make sure you understand um, okay, here we go. I'm trying to find my notes in my notebook. First, I want you to understand this foundation and review. Are you ready? Here we go. Never forget the importance of the doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, etc. Why is it important? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can't have everlasting life with, in believing in a false Jesus. You can't have everlasting life in believing in a false God. That's simple. Exodus 20 says, do not, create, do not build and make and create a graven image. We may not make a, a graven image with our hands, but we make a graven image in our mind when we have an understanding of God that's not correct and not biblical. All right, next, understand the inability of the pulpit. You may get frustrated with people, but remember, in many cases, you get, your ultimate frustration is probably with churches that did not equip these people, did not teach these people. Now, the people have a responsibility. I by no means excuse them. But just remember that the pulpit is so, sadly, it's unable and inadequate in many cases. And you got to find churches and people who will equip you and, and feed you and, 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 and protect you from that kind of thing. Next, always include the fruit of the Spirit in your theology. As you grow in your theology, maintain that fruit of the Spirit. Grow in the fruit. As you're growing in theology, at the same time, you need to be growing in the fruits of the Spirit, and they're becoming more and more plentiful in your life. All right? Now, we've got the email. The email refers to this concept that you, that Bethel Church seemed to put forth in their clarification videos, that you and I, we can live like Jesus, we can live, we can do just what Jesus did. We can do everything Jesus did. And the reason we can do so is because, and this is what the, the theological foundation for this, is basically this idea of, of Jesus supposedly emptying himself of some deity in some way, shape, or form, and he lived his life just as a man. And then what we do is with that same power of the Holy Spirit, we can do what Jesus did. Uh, because we basically are living our life just like Jesus did. Now, Jesus was sinless, so in theory, we should be able to be sinless. Jesus did, we should be able to do the same thing. Now, there's obviously a problem with that because one, it never happens. So clearly there's a problem. And number two, it ultimately is creates a false Jesus and could be literally teaching absolute complete heresy about what happened in the incarnation. My, my homework for you, the Chalcedonian definition, the definition of Chalcedon, the Chalcedonian creed, however you want to, whatever you want to call it, know that creed. Know it, know it, know it, know it, know it, and know it. I mean, like, have it built into your brain, all right? Now, yes, Twyla, it is crazy. <laughs> it is crazy, and we're going to hear from the people at Bethel in the next episode because I've got the video, I've got the uh, audio queued up. It's 18 minutes long, and we're going to start taking it apart in part two of this, and I'm going to do that, and well, Right after, I'm going to take a break now. I'll be back, take a couple of drinks of water, walk around for a second. We'll be back and we'll try to take that out. Obviously, if you can't listen to us live for the second hour, that's perfectly okay. Tune in uh, later. It'll be available, obviously, on all podcasting platforms, all right? And we're looking for some other possible places to put the podcast. Send some emails. Don't know if it will work. If we get any news, I'll let you know. We're always trying to expand it. And uh, so there you go. Um, to anyone who has any questions, email me newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. And uh, hopefully, I hope my approach here, I know I know what's going to happen. People on YouTube are going to just start listening and go, wait, he spent 30 minutes on all of that stuff. I would just want him to talk about Bethel. I, I don't care. Um, that foundation to me is of the utmost importance. I, I, I cannot stress to you the importance of that foundation that I laid. Those points I gave you at the beginning. I, I, look, if, if you don't realize the importance of them, just write them down and maybe five years from now, you'll go, wow, he, he, those were very good points. And then, you know, you can find me and say, man, remember five years ago, you, you, you were right. Okay. Because I, I really believe that those are important uh, principles. All right. We'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you for the email. 
We'll be back. We got a lot to talk about. This is a lot. This is this is going to take a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm going to put in as many hours as it takes to help everyone understand this. All right. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes. God bless.